I think it's important that we know what's happening uh, elsewhere in the world uh, so we can get a, maybe a little bit of a perspective if you get a chance. Some of our young people actually went on that trip, some of them are here today. Uh, ask them about what that was like to go to a, a foreign land and to share the gospel. Uh, man, that'll change you. It really will. Uh, it'll change you to be regularly in the Lord's Word. Uh, so I would encourage you, uh, if you find somebody, I, I know of two that are here today, if you find them and you ask them, hey, what's that trip like? You know, just give us like, just a quick blurb. I think um, a quick blurb, excuse me. Um, I, I think you'll be incredibly blessed for sure. I just walked up front, and I think one of these two guys uh, said something very funny when I walked up. They said, man, this kid is hairy. Uh, referring to my wrists or something. So, uh, it's, it's been a constant encouragement this morning. Somebody told me I looked like Rafiki from The Lion King earlier. Uh, that was also a huge blessing. Another huge blessing. So I just want to thank everybody for just building me up in the Lord today. Um, Alright, so we have uh, some time. And again, I think that's important that we sing and we know what's going on overseas. But also, most important, is the preaching of God's Word and that we would be willing to be convicted. So, we're going to go through... A passage, um, I was kind of uh, battling myself uh, again, just like I usually do when we're th doing this, on what passage to preach on. And, um, you know, uh, you've heard messages on salvation, right? Right? You've heard messages on not sinning, right? Well, there's another element to the Christian life that I think we need to be well aware of. And I'm sure it's been preached here before, but I think it has to be uh, a hallmark of our walk with the Lord. And it's just trusting God with whatever he's doing. All right? I might be a little loud. I don't know if there's a way to take that down. Uh, so, and this is just a, a basic thing. This is the same way you got saved. You got saved by trusting Jesus Christ to save you. Well, the same way that you're going to grow closer with the Lord is trusting Jesus Christ. It's still trusting the Lord. It's still trusting what he does on a daily basis. And so this message, I would hope that you guys apply it to your hearts. And we're in Hebrews 3. And I think, uh, by the grace of God, it will be a blessing. Chapter 3. We'll read the whole chapter. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was, a faith, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The chapter starts out as a question. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ, you Hebrew believers. Consider him. Consider what he's done. Consider that he's been faithful, that he obeyed God in every facet. And they make the illustration because a Hebrew, a Jew, is going to identify more with Moses than, say, the Apostle Paul these days. Uh, especially now. And so when they're building the case for a, a Jew to get saved, they're saying, think back to Moses. Moses himself was faithful in all the tasks that God gave him. But Jesus was more so. And then it goes on to develop the case that Jesus himself was God. And then they say this. Every building has a builder, a master architect. You understand what I'm talking about? If you go downtown, if you go uh, downtown to Cincinnati or Columbus, you'll see some cascading buildings that are quite beautiful, and you'll know that there was somebody behind those plans. There was a city planner. There was an architect. There was some sort of agent that would go across and to make sure that all the building codes were in order, and all those types of things. There is somebody behind the plan, and they're saying that in the way that Moses began this incredible exodus, and yet God used him in a great way, Jesus Christ more so. And Jesus Christ is God. Let's go on. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, let's pause right there. In the scriptures, the Holy Ghost is actually a quiet personality of God. He's active all the time, but he prefers to put all of his attention to Jesus Christ. This is one of the rare circumstances in the Bible where the Holy Ghost is actually talking. 
Now, the whole Bible is God, Holy Ghost, breathe words. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. But preferably, the Holy Ghost always points back to Jesus Christ. So let's listen in to what the Holy Ghost has to say. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, let's, I want us to just really soak in this verse. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So, I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief, faithlessness. Somebody that doesn't have faith in God, the Bible calls it wicked and evil. It's evil. This is very serious stuff. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. For some, when they had heard this, when they heard, did provoke. How be it? All that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear you that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's pray. Father, I ask you for your power and your strength, Lord, and that everybody would be locked in from the youngest bus rider, from the youngest Sunday school attendee, to the most mature worker, uh, the most uh, mature before you. Uh, Lord, I just ask that we would all be locked in and praying that we would understand something today, that we would let the word go across our hearts as a mirror, showing it where we have fallen and where we have forsaken thy commandment. God, I just ask for your power. I ask that you would forgive me of my own sins, that I may be a clean vessel for you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. The title of this message is, Trust Him for Your Rest. Trust Him for Your Rest. Have you ever asked an elephant in the room type question? Has there ever been a time where you, you know what an elephant in the room is? Something you probably shouldn't have asked. Um, who remembers that there used to be a Max and Irma's on Peter Road here? Anyone else remember that? Probably about five, six years ago, maybe more, there used to be a Max and Irma's. Max and Irma's is like Fridays or the Mountain Beach. It was right down the street. Well... My friend Joe and Jeremy from high school used to work at that Max and Irma's. And it was nice to see them. They were some of my closer friends. And every time I would see them, we, would, we grew up joking around and having a lot of fun together. So it was like I was seeing an old friend. They weren't saved. They weren't born again. But I cared for them and I loved them. And when I see them, I enjoy hanging out with them. Uh, it happens every so often. It hasn't happened in a while. But my friend Joe, and I may have shared this story with you a couple years ago, I believe. You, I think it was just in the college class that I shared this story. My friend Joe has been dating a girl named Ashley Lorco since we were in 10th grade, okay? He would break up with Ashley Lorco all the time, all right? And then they would get back together, and then they would break up, and then they would get back together, they would break up. And he told me that there was a week where they broke up every day in that week. This is how much he breaks up with this girl, which I always thought was quite funny, you know, that somebody would... They were like, I hate you, and they would break up. Let's get back together. I love you. I hate you. Let's break up. Let's get back together. I love you. Imagine that seven consecutive days. I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And in fact, uh, Ashley was kind of loopy. You know, not to sound that all women are crazy. You know, like we have great women at this church. Let's be real. There are some, and some men equally that are crazy as well. But there are many women that are also crazy. And so I thought that was very funny. And Joe himself was a little crazy as well. So there was one day where I was sitting uh, with my friend Drew and my friend Chris Rosito. We were about to have lunch after a church service one day. And I saw my friend Joe. And Jeremy was about 10 seats behind me. So I was just small talking with my friend Joe. I haven't seen him in a while. And I said, Joe, so how's Ashley doing? And in the back row, I see my friend Jeremy going like this. What do, you, what do you think he was trying to show me? 
Don't ask about Ash. Don't ask. And so I was looking at, I was like, uh, I'm sorry, should I not say anything? Else? Oh, yeah, Ashley's Ashley or something. Ashley's fine or something like that. So I just left the topic alone. And so I walked away from that meeting thinking, I probably shouldn't have asked that question. I asked an elephant in the room type question. There are some things that you probably shouldn't ask when somebody comes into a room. There are other times, if you talk to somebody, and they're a type of personality, they might tell you what they've learned from whatever they've been through. Do you know that others who have been through a great trial of difficulty, that, that, that God has brought them through, they're a lot of times more willing to talk about it? For instance, I met a man a, long, a couple of years ago who, had, who remembers personally what it was like to be, grow, through, grow up through Pearl Harbor. You guys remember Pearl Harbor? When the Japanese bombed the, the bay? And I asked him, what was that like? What was World War II like? And he said, oh, it was awful. And he just told me about the experience of what it would be like to grow up during Pearl Harbor. I talked to another man who remembers distinctly and specifically what, it was, what the country was like when JFK died. You know, John F. Kennedy Jr., or excuse me, just John F. Kennedy? Um, what it was like in this nation, in this world, when JFK himself died because he was assassinated. I asked him, what was that like? And they were like, man, the whole country was in a depressed state. Re a couple years ago, probably about five years ago, um, excuse me, no, no, this was the anniversary of 9-11, of so we're talking about 2011. A friend of mine and I were going around to some of the precincts and the police departments and the fireplaces, uh, fire departments, excuse me, to invite them to a dinner that our church was hosting for public servants. And we bumped into a man, I talked to him, and I was like, hey, how's it going? And he was dressed like a fireman, and he said, hey, how you doing? And I was like, whoa, he's not from Cleveland. Where do you think he's from if somebody talks like that? New York, Brooklyn, all right? So yeah, you got some New York guys. All right, so this guy is clearly from Brooklyn. And I'm talking, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And he goes, oh, I'm not from around here. And I'm like, I just gotta figure that out. You know, but that's okay. And I was like, what are you doing here? And he goes, well, we're promoting a memorial service and different things and, and, uh, and a public consciousness for 9-11. And I asked him, I said, sir, were you at Ground Zero? And he said, yes, I was there. He was at the 9-11, the, the, the planes crashed, he was there. And I said, sir, I know I probably shouldn't ask this. What was that like? And you know, he paused for a moment. He looked back just a little bit past me and he said, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And I knew that I probably shouldn't have asked that question, but that's why he was there. But you know, he was willing to share that with me. And you know the passage talks about God being free and God being hurt and God's heart being broken. Did you guys see that in that passage? I was grieved that generation. You know, it's a lot like Jesus Christ came to church today. And what if Jesus Christ came right as we were studying this passage? And he walks through the doors and, you know, Jesus Christ doesn't make a big scene. He is always in the midst of people. What if he walked right through those doors and he saw that sat down quietly and you and I just instantly knew it was Jesus Christ. And we thought to ourselves, as we're studying this passage, there's something a little confusing about this. Why, why was his heart so grieved? Why was he so broken? So what if as you and I were studying this passage, that this, uh, this elaborate passage, maybe some doctrinal verses, one of us had the courage to ask Jesus to the face and say, Lord, maybe we shouldn't ask this question. What happened in the wilderness that day? Why were you so grieved? What happened back then? And what if Jesus... Just like that man, maybe he winced a little. Maybe there was a glistening in his eye. There was a tear in his eye as he thought, oh, the wilderness. You want to know about the wilderness? You want to know what happened that day? And you know what he tells? I was grieved with that generation. It really hurt me. God was grieved. And you know what he would tell us? That generation should have trusted me for their rest. They should have trusted me for their rest. What is this brief overview in this chapter? Well, we have to understand first and foremost, what is Israel's relationship with Egypt? 
Egypt is a lot like bondage, because that's what it was, and then the exodus is the freedom from that bondage. All right, so let's think about Israel's historical relationship with Egypt for just a second. First, Joseph went down into Egypt, and he helped save his own family. So Joseph was elevated to his place of power, and he was able to help his own father and his brothers, just like someday down the road, Jesus will be coming in and eliminating Satan and the Antichrist and all those kinds of things, and he will again rise up Israel. So that's a picture of that. So they went down to Egypt, but then a few hundred years later, a pharaoh rose up. He was, I believe, from the, uh, the Hicketts or something like that, that tribe or something like that. Or no, that was the Semitic people. But there was another pharaoh that rose up, and all of a sudden, he did not appreciate the Jews too much. In fact, he was well aware of the times where they had risen up and they tried to overthrow Pharaoh. So they thought to themselves, let's kill all these young boys, let's kill all the men, we'll put them in bondage, we'll make them make pyramids and limestone, we'll make them do those types of things, and we ourselves will control this people. And for a couple hundred years, for a the Israelites were there, serving in servitude and in bondage to this Pharaoh as they cried out. Then they were delivered by a man named, thank you, Moses. Moses delivered them. And as they were going into the promised land, they were supposed to, it was supposed to be just a couple days journey. And then do you remember the story of, of, of uh, excuse me, Caleb and of Joshua? Do you remember that? As they were, and then the other ten spies, the ten spies came with a bad report, the two spies came with a good one, and they said, they said oh, we can't do it. The, the Anakin's there, the, the, the walls are up to heaven. We couldn't do it, we couldn't do it if we wanted to. And God's saying, why don't they trust me? But they didn't trust him for their rest. You know what rest is? Rest isn't salvation. Rest isn't being born again. Rest is the promise that God has for your life. Rest is where God wants you to be. Rest is where God wants your will to be. So if somebody's supposed to go be a preacher here, God wants you to be a preacher, and that's his best for you. If somebody wants to be a dentist here, God wants you to be a dentist, and that's his best for you. That's your rest. And for this called out group of people, this nation of Israel, the best that God had for them at that time was this land flowing with milk and honey, grapes of Eshel, this place that was a fertile grand land. And they understood that, but they thought to themselves, you know, God sure delivered us from Egypt. There is no way we'll be able to handle the Canaanites of this land. And that people did not trust them. And here's God watching the whole thing develop. And each time, they, they each testimony from those ten spies that were supposed to search out the land and say, Joshua, Moses, here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. They came back, and each time it was a blow to God. Ow! Ow! Another person didn't trust me. Ow! Another person didn't trust me. And they continued to not trust God. And God, I bet you, winced every time they didn't trust him. Every single time it hurt him. Every single time, it broke his heart that they wouldn't trust him for their rest. So what was the pattern here that happened? Well, the Holy Ghost tells us in verse 7, verse 12, and verse 17. Unbelief, they sinned, and they fell in the wilderness. And here's the pattern. Unbelief, sin, wilderness. So if you don't believe, you sin, and God will keep you where you want to stay at. He will never fulfill his plan in your life. He'll never do it. You want to know why? Because you don't believe him. You don't believe that he'll help you with sin. You don't believe that he'll help you for his will for your life, to do whatever it is God called you to do. And God will keep you there. And you will fall in your own wilderness. You'll stay there. And that's how your story ends. But it wasn't all like that. Because there are people that escaped the wilderness, Joshua and Caleb, namely, and the pattern that we see for them is this. Verse 6, verse 3, we see confidence, Christ's glory, and then their rest. You know, I want to make something very clear here. This passage, a lot of people use to say, this is how you can know you can lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. Because you know what the promised land was? It wasn't their eternal salvation. It wasn't their sins being forgiven. You know what it was, the promised land? Gravel, <laughs> livestock, a promise for them to be able to become an agricultural society and to be able to be this world power, to be able to work and to have a country and a name and a people. And this is what God is trying to do. That was God's plan for Israel. 
And God has a plan for you too. But you have to believe him. How else do I know that this is not a plan for uh, salvation? Rest is not salvation. I want to make this very clear. Although it could metaphorically be that way. Listen to this. This chapter is written to believers. And then it says this. My brethren, our profession. He's talking to people that are saved already. And he's telling them, if you want God to do the best for you, the best thing he wants for you, you have to believe him. You have to trust him. It's got to come from you. It can't come from, you know, the Bible says he has dealt the measure of faith to every man. You have the ability to believe God. But if you don't, you'll fall. You'll stay in your wilderness. And that's going to be the end of your story. And maybe you'll live a few years. Maybe God will be long-suffering because he is and he's merciful and he's gracious even in judgment. But i got to tell you, the best thing that can ever happen to you, it won't happen. You want to know why? Because you had a faith in your own self. You didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. You didn't trust him for your rest. You didn't trust him to finish it, to have total trust in God. But why should we trust God? Well, the Bible tells us in verses 2 to 6 that he is greater than Moses and that he's faithful to him that appointed him. All right, so would you say that Moses was a faithful God? Didn't he deliver the nation of Israel? Yeah? Didn't, didn't he do those things? Didn't he, I mean, I think about millions of people were delivered out of Israel because of Moses. Do you know that Jesus Christ, the Bible says he's faithful to him that appointed him? Do you want to know what that means? So Jesus is submissive to God the Father, okay? But Jesus is God. Jesus is the Father, but he's also the Son. And he's willing to admit to, to say, like, you know what, there are things that I want to do. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to do them even though he's God. Isn't that, a, I mean, a wild thought? The fact that there's God the, fun, God, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Ghost, and they all interact with each other, yet they are one person? They are one deity? What, I mean, isn't that amazing? Can't you do the same thing? Can't you interact with the Son and just say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. Yeah, okay, I'll do that too. Because you know that each time you don't, God is saying, ow, oh, ooh, ow, that hurts, ow, this is very grievous to me, and it hurts his feelings, it hurts God's soul, the Bible says his soul is vexed. God's heart is hurt, it's broken, do you trust him for your rest, I think it talks about a building, you know, like, if you go see an incredible building. Who's ever been in the Empire State Building? You ever been there? I've been there. It's pretty neat. Who's ever been around the Statue of Liberty? You ever been around the Statue of Liberty? I went there once. I was uh, with, with the school, and they took a picture of me, and in the background were the two towers that once stood there, because I had gone there before September 11th. I remember looking at this thing, you know, there was, a, there was an architect that created those two towers, and there was a person behind it. And they came crashing. And it's over for those powers. And yet God is saying, I can build even greater things in your life. But you have to trust me. But if we trust ourselves, if we trust, you know, like this is what I want to do. Like, you know, that church stuff, they keep talking about serving God. And yeah, it sounds good. I mean, like, it would be good to raise my kids up like that. But it's not for everybody. You know, certainly we all have our schedules. And we all have school, and we all have, we gotta make money. I mean, we certainly gotta make money, we gotta do all those types of things. But God is saying, man, I wonder if they won't just trust me for this little piece of their life. I wonder if they won't just trust me for this little element of their life, that I wanna do so many great things for them. And you know what's gonna happen to that person that keeps refusing and keeps refusing to trust God? I'm talking about for simple things. You know what's gonna happen to that? They will fall in the wilderness. Faith. Christ's glory, and you enter his life. You enter God's best for your life. You know what's incredible about Christ being a builder? He's always been. You know, what made Moses less than Jesus Christ in this, in this context is that Moses had a beginning. He was a human being, just like you and me. And that something had to happen for Moses to exist. Something biological, Something, some, some training had to happen for that. But for God, the Alpha and the Omega, he has no beginning. Nothing caused God. 
Nothing created it. You understand what I'm talking about? Can't you trust something like that? Wouldn't you be able to trust a God like that? A God that says, I want to tell you how powerful I am. I have no beginning. I am uncaused. I am greater than Moses. Like, you don't even know how much I'm greater than Moses. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the High and Lofty, what the Bible says. The Bible talks about how he flung the stars into the sky. Can you trust somebody that has the ability to fling stars? I think so. And yet, what are the things in your life right now that just seem like, okay, I haven't released this part of my life to God yet. Your decisions, your own will, your ability just to make choices, don't you want that to be God's will? Because each time you don't believe God, do you know what's actually happening? Ooh. Ow. Oh, they hurt me again. Oh, they hurt me again. They hurt me one more time. They keep hurting me. They don't believe me. They're not believing me for the first words. They, they hurt me again. They just don't trust me. I wonder why they don't trust me. It's like the little boy who wants to help his dad out to work on the car, or the little daughter that wants to help her mother in the kitchen. And the mom says, you're just too young for this. Or the dad says, you're just too young for this. You know, in a lot of ways, it's like we're getting God right here. Like he's our little toddler. And we're saying, God, you can't handle this for my life. You, I mean, you couldn't do that, could you? I mean, there's very little to consider. What, I mean, that's a stake here. Lord, you know, like, you have all these rules and all these things and all these aspirations for my own life. You don't know what it's like to live in this world. I got to work 40 hours a week. I got to go to school. I have all these things to do. I have all my friends to consider. I have my own family. I have my own will. I have my own dreams that I would like to do. But I don't want for you to be a part of it. Well, you know why? Because we don't quite believe God. We think he has a beginning. We think that he's less than what he says he is. But God says, you can trust me. You want to know why you can trust me? He is the uncaused builder. He's the uncaused God. So here's Jesus. He tells us the whole story. We sat down and we asked him, Lord, what happened in the wilderness? Well, what happened? And he told us it was just a group of people that didn't believe. As simple as possible. I had so many dreams and aspirations for them. And they just didn't believe me. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, to you, to you, to you, to you, to you. And he's saying, will you believe me? <coughs> will you trust me? You know, it, it actually really hurts me when people don't trust me. You know, when people come up to me and they, they doubt that I can do something for them, it actually hurts my feelings. It really does. I wonder what God does. I wonder when we can't trust Him for little things in our life. We can't believe Him. This is the next step of your Christian life. Because I know that week after week, everybody here raises their hands that they're saved, and maybe there are some that are not saved. But most, by and large, this group of people has been coming here for weeks and months, and some even years for a time. And by and large, this group is saved. Do you want to know what the next step of your Christian life is? Believing everything God says. And literally doing it by your works, in action. Okay, because salvation is just you trusting Jesus Christ and saying, okay, I understand that. By your own actions now, you have to start trusting God. And first, that is faith. But secondarily, you got to put legs to it. You understand what I'm talking about? So there might be somebody here that is called to be a preacher or is called to be a preacher's wife or a missionary. Or, or somebody that is supposed to be in ministry, or regularly playing the piano when somebody asks you to put it, or singing in the choir, or going on door-to-door -door visitation. There might be somebody here that God is already working on your heart. Why aren't you doing those types of things for me? And you know what you have to do? Okay. I believe you. And you know what God says? Oh, they really trust me. So Jesus is here, and we're asking him, is that it? He's like, yeah. That's all I really want for you. I just want you to trust me. And isn't, isn't that what every close friend wants for you to trust them? Every father, every mother, isn't that what they want from their kids? Mom, I trust you. Dad, I trust you. And God says, I want that for my kids. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.